Fear can be caused by a variety of things, including heights, falling, and sharks. The power of the brain to enter these virtual states as if they were real is what allows people to be afraid of things that don't necessarily scare everyone. For example, by using 360 video to create a virtual environment where someone is swimming with sharks, or by using VR to create a simulated car that could run someone over. The way we experience fear and stress is largely determined by our physiology and the way we interact with our environment. 360 video cannot create the same level of fear and stress as mixed reality, which allows for more interaction and engagement. The lowest level of stress or autonomic arousal is associated with the pausing slash freezing response, while the highest level of autonomic arousal is associated with advancing toward the threat. By understanding how these circuits work, we can develop treatments that help people safely and effectively confront their fears. This sweet spot varies depending on the task and environment. Jack Feldman argues that most great mathematics is done by people in their late teens and twenties because of the tremendous demand on working memory to work out theorems and keep a number of plates spinning mentally. In physics, there is a reliance on working memory, but an increased reliance on deep memory stores. However, it is not the only factor that determines success in these areas. Biology, experience, and other factors also play a role. We can be correct about some things without being exhaustive. Neuroscience is still in its infancy and we may not know everything about the brain. It would be helpful if there were a way to turn the effects of psychedelics on and off so that people could benefit from the neuroplasticity-inducing effects while avoiding the risks. The best way to do this is to use devices that bring more of the somatic experience into it, like virtual reality or augmented reality. It is important to be careful about bringing in other people's sensory experiences early in the day, as this can interfere with your ability to process information from sleep. The best way to optimize cognitive performance is to control the sensory environment and limit the amount of information coming in. Some people have taken this to the extreme, to the point where they don't look at faces in the early part of the day. However, this can lead to a less rounded life. There's an interesting set of studies that have come out of David Ginty's lab at Harvard Med, looking at these are mouse mutants where these are models for autism, where nothing is disrupted in the brain proper and in the central nervous system, but the sensory app the sensory neurons, the ones that innervate the skin and the ears and everything are, are hypersensitive. And this maps to a mutation in certain forms of human autism. So this means that the, the overload of sensory information and sensory experience that a lot of autistics feel, they're like that they can't tolerate things. And then they get the stereotype behaviors, the rocking and the kind of the shouting it, you know, we always thought of that as a brain problem. In some cases it might be, but in many cases it's because they just can't, they, they seem to have a, it's like turning the volume up on every sense. And so they're overwhelmed and none of us want to become like that. I think it's very hard for them and it's hard for their parents and so forth. The interoceptive system is responsible for processing information about the internal environment, while the extraoceptive system is responsible for processing information about the external environment. The two systems are modulated by levels of autonomic arousal. When we are relaxed, the two systems can move around freely. When we are alert, the two systems are tethered in place. Extraoception is the perception of anything that's beyond the reach of my skin. The circuitry of the brain is essential to its ability to create complex mental representations. Let's stick to vision. The reason that the visual system is such a great model for addressing these kinds of questions and other systems are hard, is we can control the stimuli. We're mostly visual animals to navigate, survive. Humans mainly rely on vision, not smell or something else, but it's a filter for cognition and it's a, it's a strong driver of cognition. The visual system is one example of how the brain can represent information in a concrete way, but at some point, the representations become more abstract and cannot be explained by simple point-to-point -point wiring. The cortex is responsible for higher-level functions such as thinking and reasoning, while the subcortex is responsible for more basic functions such as movement and breathing. Neuroscientists are only just beginning to understand how the different parts of the brain work together, but it is clear that the subcortex plays a vital role in controlling behavior. 
In particular, the subcortex is responsible for generating the electrical signals that are necessary for muscle movement. Stimulating the subcortex with electrical signals can therefore be used to control behavior. This is why deep brain stimulation, DBS, is an effective treatment for conditions like Parkinson's disease. This can be done by controlling the level of activation of the prefrontal cortex. The thalamus is a structure that is known to act like a machine, and the pulvinar and hypothalamus are known for their role in writing scripts. The neocortex is an interesting structure to explore because it is still not fully understood. This happens at the level of the neuron, and it is this transformation that allows us to do things like read and understand language. However, they are facing challenges when it comes to accessing deeper brain structures. Neuralink and other companies are working on ways to interface with the brain, which could help unlock the mysteries of consciousness. Both are important, but the latter is more important because it is closer to the goal of consciousness. However, AI research is expensive and time-consuming, so it is important to have conversations about AI at multiple levels in order to make progress. From the AI perspective, I view the brain as less sacred and am more comfortable with poetic BS about the brain as long as it helps engineer intelligence systems. He has a strong work ethic and is constantly pushing himself to improve. He is also an admirable person who has found love and forms a strong team with his partner. He also has a lot of interesting things to say about neuroplasticity and how the brain works. This will help you overcome any challenges you face in life. This activation can lead to feelings of frustration or quitting. The key is to find a balance between the two. Robert Sapolsky believes that academic institutions like Stanford and MIT are some of the most magical places for inspiring people to dream and build the future. He also believes that it is a great privilege to be a part of these universities. I also want to put valuable tools into the world that can help people understand and direct their states of mind and body. However, one way to think about it is to consider what gives our lives purpose and meaning. For some people, this may be their work, their relationships, their hobbies, or their spirituality. Others may find meaning in simply enjoying the moment and appreciating the beauty of life. We can find rewards and meaning in even the most difficult of situations. Huberman talks about how our brains are constantly changing and how we need to learn to adapt to these changes in order to find meaning in our lives. He also talks about how our goal should be to get as many trips up and down the staircase of meaning as we can before the reaper comes for us. Carl Jung says that you are not what happened to you, but what you choose to become. This podcast will help you become the best version of yourself.